Hello, my fan friends. Welcome to another Rahala Stapa this week with the amazing Robin Asquith and a lot of fun from confessions and uh, all sorts of stuff that we talk about films uh, and his body lifestyle. It's a lot of fun. Um, great man, looks fantastic. And uh, you'll be able to see him because we, if you uh, you can watch the video, the video will be up on YouTube. You may be watching it now. Look, here's me. I've lost a bit of weight, haven't I? Um, and we are, these are the only two video ones from the Clapham, uh, Clapham Grand Run. So thanks to the Clapham Grand for having us, of course. Uh, and we'll be going up on YouTube. But the next series of Rahul Stubb is going to be filmed, but it's going to be live streamed. And I don't think we're going to put it on uh, YouTube. You're going to have to pay to see it because we're doing it for charity. We are going to raise money for the Mount Vernon Cancer Centre, the Lister Hospital and for the Museum of Comedy. Uh, and so we would like you, if possible, to pay to watch one or all of those podcasts live streamed. They're £10 per show. That's two guests per show. That's a little secret. Don't tell anyone. Uh, and uh, so only £10 to see both shows or there'll be eight shows and you can buy a season pass for only £50. And if you are a monthly badger or if you become a monthly badger before you buy your passes, you can get 50% off those tickets. So £5 per show and £25 only for the entire run. If you fancy buying those tickets, head to gfsboxoffice.com slash Rahalastapa. That's gfsboxoffice.com slash Rahalastapa uh, to uh, buy your tickets. Your proceeds will go to charity. You will get to see everything that happens in those shows uncut. If you're watching them live, we may cut stuff down if anything happens or, uh, that's outrageous, but um, for the podcast and for anything else after that. But basically, you can be part of seeing the show. Guests coming up include probably Bob Mortimer, The Parapod, Tim Key, David Mitchell, Adam and Joe, um, Phil Wang, Dave, Ben Shepard, probably some women as well. As I record this a bit before my holiday, we haven't booked everyone. And I'm very desperately trying to make it balanced between male and female. But all the people who've come back and confirmed are men. I've asked several women to be on the show. Uh, so it won't be all white, middle class, middle aged men. Um, I promise you that. Although it nearly is that at the moment. And there's a bonus one as well we're doing in... Um, August on a Sunday afternoon, which you can buy tickets for as well. Hopefully that'll be on sale now. I don't know who the guests are yet, but very excited about doing that, where we'll test out the equipment so that the live streaming may go wrong, but that's a bonus one if you have the series pass. Um, so look out for that. GoFasterStrike.com slash badges if you want to become a monthly badger so you can take advantage of that amazing special offer. Only £3 a month to be a monthly badger, so, you know, you do the maths. Um, and uh, you can stop being a monthly badger at any time. You could do it for one month and then stop. Don't be a dick, though. It's for charity. Uh, and if you feel like giving some extra money to charity, uh, go to justgiving.com slash monoball, and that money will go to my medical NHS charities as well. And I'm running a half marathon in November. Look at me. Look how strong I am. Um, so let's sit back, relax, and enjoy this very enjoyable interview with Robin Asquith. 70 fucking years old he is. You would not believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Clapham Grand. Please welcome a man who has run 20 miles in the last eight days. It's Richard Herring. Thank you very much, my goodness. Hello. It's as full as it can get here at the Clapham Grand. I love to see you all. Thanks so much for coming uh, to... Uh, what is called, I should have opened this before I got on as always, uh, Richard Herring's Loquacious Shits Talking Podcast. Uh, it's, it's basically what it is all the time. Should have just you called it that from the start. Um, though I was, uh, I was talking to Badil and Skinner and the Lightning Seeds. Remember that song from the 1990s? Remember that? They all got together. Remember the 1990s? Remember it? Uh, they call it Rahalastapa, apparently, in this case. It's, and said it's coming home. They said, they said something about it coming home. The people listening to this as a podcast will know whether it's come home or not. Uh, when David Bedil was on the other week, I've, I tried to pitch to him that we should do a song that I've written the lyrics to, which are, it's come home, it's come home. Look, there it is over there. So we'll know... If that's number one as you listen to this, you'll know that we won the football. Uh, we're all hopeful here, tragically. Uh, and so, yeah, welcome to the show. It's absolutely lovely to be back at the Clapham Grand uh, for the last two weeks this week, and we'll be back next week as well, obviously. Um, 
to do the next one. Uh, and um, what have I? Oh yeah, I've, I've been training for my my running. Um, my BMI is now uh, 29.8, which means I'm officially not a beast. I'm not except. Well, that's first thing in the morning. After breakfast, I'm a beast again. But first thing in the morning, I'm simply overweight now. Uh, I've lost uh, 3.5 kilograms since we first did the Clapham Grand. So that's not too bad. That's just, this is fitting a little bit better than it was at the start. So that's good. Um, and yeah, I've been running. I've run uh, and running eight. I ran eight miles, eight and a half miles yesterday, yesterday morning. Not bad, is it? I've got to do 13. Uh, if you want to sponsor me, I'm running uh, a half marathon in November uh, for, to raise funds for the two uh, hospitals that uh, one of them cut my bollock off. I don't know why I'm raising money for them. <laughs> and one of them <laughs> stitched me back up again, so that they should get most of the money. Uh, go to justgiving.com slash monoball and um, <laughs> you can do donate to that. If you're glad that I'm still alive, if you're disappointed I'm still alive, I mean, go to the List Hospital, smash up a scanner. Um, <laughs> And uh, this week I have been thinking about, I, had, I just had this thought, I just wondered, and it's not a morbid thought, it sort of sounds like it is, but I just think it's quite an interesting. Has the photo that will be on my obituary been taken yet? That is, the, that is and it's quite, for me, it's, some people it's obvious whether they, they will be or not. Sometimes you think, well, they're definitely, they're, I'm not sure I've done my most successful thing. I, I've not done a standout thing yet. And so I can be hopeful in the third act of my life that could be when I do something successful. Or it'll be, you know, me standing next to Stuart Lee behind him. <laughs> that, might be, that might be what we get. It's just quite an interesting thing, and it's quite, quite interesting. Oh, Annika Rice actually tweeted me when I tweeted about this, and I'd said, you know, you're definitely, the picture of you will definitely be you in a jumpsuit from Treasure Hunt or Challenge Annika. Whatever you do, you could cure cancer now, you could win a Nobel Prize. And she said, it will just be my ass. it won't even be my face. And so some people you know, and some people you think, well, it's quite, quite interesting. Be interesting. So I'm going to ask uh, next week's guests about that. And I wonder if they've had their obituary photo. I mean, I hope Ed Gamble has. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm hoping to kill him today. Uh, so, um, and uh, what else have I got to do? I've been trying to come up with, I'm going to do uh, at least a show about my, uh, my situation this year and maybe a podcast and maybe a book as well. So I've been trying to come up with titles for that. Well, every time I say this on Twitter, people suggest titles and it annoys me because I'm, I'm a professional and I've thought of all the good titles and I don't need... This year, the last week I just said I'm going to block anyone who suggests titles and just everyone's kept on suggesting titles. <laughs> And I knew they liked me and were fans of mine, and I had to block them. It was tragic. Uh, but here, the ones I've come up with, so my two favourites are Can I Have My Ball Back? Uh, which I quite like. Uh, and Never Mind My Bollock. That is... Uh, you see, that, the first one went better out of those two. I was, I, was, I was drifting towards the second. Right, we'll come back later for more stuff. Let's, we've got a, a fantastic, okay, absolutely unbelievable... Uh, guest for you uh, this week's podcast. He's probably best known for playing Ray Fay in Queen Kong. That's why we're here. A film that was <laughs> a film that was never released, but that I watched on YouTube this morning. That is 90 minutes of my life. I'm not fucking getting back, so I'm taking it out. Will you please welcome the amazing Robin Asquith, ladies and gentlemen? Amazing. Look at this man. Incredible. <laughs> it's an illusion, isn't it? I mean, it, it really is. The, p the pills wear off at about nine, and then I disintegrate. <laughs> so, let's talk about Queen Kong. I've, <laughs> like, I've, I've, I've watched two films as a research for this. I've watched Queen Kong, and i watched Confe the first Confessions film. And I so in Confessions, I was watching your ass bumping up and down in a load of foam and thinking I've oh, never by had the to way, do this for a guest before. By the way, that's my obituary photograph. <laughs> okay, I think it might be. That's it. Well, yours has definitely been taken. It's yours my art, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, tremendous. Yeah, I think maybe hanging out the window, that one when you're hanging out the window, yeah, that, that yes, might yes. be your obituary photo. Yeah, February. Your arse will be involved. <laughs> it will be, yes. Tell us about Queen Kong, though, because it is it's quite an interesting Well, story. it was 1976, and um, I just won the most promising newcomer uh, award, um, if you excuse the expression, um, 
<laughs> I, so it's all, I was all baffed up, and I was very pleased with myself. And so I, my agent said, we're going to look around, and, and we'll, we'll see if there's something... Um, we'll look for something really interesting for you. And um, in those days, if you won an award, it actually put you out of work for about a year. Um, you just didn't work because you won an award uh, for some strange reason. In any case, the first thing that my agent came up with, she said, this, sound, this I think is a really good idea. Um, it's called Queen Kong. And um, I really thought she'd lost her marbles, bless her. <laughs> and um, so I said, well, what's it about? She said, well, it, it's a, a role reversal. It's, it, it's a female gorilla with big breasts who, who falls in love with Ray Fay as opposed to Faye Ray. And uh, you're the only male in it, and there's dancing girls. And th I said, I, I thought we were looking for something <laughs> serious, you know. And I I'd sort of was warming up my Coriolanus, if you'll excuse the expression. And um, uh, I, this script was presented to me, and I've never read such tosh <laughs> in my life. It was just unbelievable. Um, and, and, and I really did think it was a joke. And it was the hot summer of 76. And uh, it was shot at Shepperton Studios. And um, I, I could, by the way, I eventually got lured into it. I've never been paid so much money in my life. Um, <laughs> and there was nothing else going on. And I thought, oh, well, why not dancing naked girls and uh, a female gorilla with big knockers? It's going to be an interesting... Um, an interesting I'm at school, of course, I had imagined playing Hamlet and God knows, yeah. God knows what else. But there I was with a gorilla with big tit. And um, it was a fascinating summer, to be honest. Yeah. It's an interesting film. Now, like, it's, there's, there's some plot holes in it. Uh, and um, <laughs> the special effects aren't great. But, um, A, it reminded, in some parts of it, it reminded me of Airplane. There were bits of it that were like Airplane. True. Before Airplane. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of bits that weren't like airplanes. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but also there's the sort of big, I mean, it's sort of having its cake and eating it a little bit, but there's, it's got a sort of feminist women's lib ending where you give an impassioned speech to all the women watching about how they're being, you know, uh, yes. overlooked. Well, to, well, your friend Stuart Lee yeah. had, 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 has, has written a dissertation on it. He's actually <laughs> impassioned by the whole thing. Uh, and asked me to sign the book. I mean, I, the poor man is um, obviously de de delusional, but um, no, he'd, uh, um, he thinks it's a whole sort of ahead of its time tale of feminism and the, yeah. and the fight and everything. To me, it's about a gorilla with big tits, you know, but, <laughs> and, um, and me dancing around with lots of naked girls and getting their phone numbers. And, um, um, but uh, you talk about the special effects. The, yeah. it, 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 was, it was shot at Shepperton, and there was... Um, a special effects company called Bill Butt Richardson uh, and Kirkland, Kirkland Richard, B BBRK, Richardson Kirkland. Um, and they, w they eventually bought Shepard and Studios with Ridley Scott. Uh, and they, they were the huge um, special effects people. And they've been employed to build this huge gorilla, um, a female gorilla, um, which had to. Um, uh, appear in the film at, at some point uh, and there was, great, there was great excitement um, but the day uh, of the gorilla appearing but they were running out of money these Italians, it was made by Italians uh, were running out of money and uh, David Bill, one of Bill Button Richardson said, Robin I've got to have a word with you because we all got on well he said, um, so I've got a word with you uh, the gorilla's not going to be all it's made out to be and I thought, <laughs> oh he said, don't get too excited about the gorilla. <laughs> so uh, the day came, uh, and there's cameras everywhere, cover cameras everywhere, um, girls dancing in the skirts, and it's the boomba, 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 but where you saw it this morning. <laughs> and the, the gates open, and out comes this huge 72-foot gorilla. Well, actually, what happened was, first of all, the first assistant director couldn't speak a word of English. Um, and he would, got very, very excited because there were so many cameras. And he said, it is very, very important. This, we, we have to shit. We must shit now. Otherwise, we lose the shit. Um, which is the only thing she managed. So he said, oh, are you ready to shit? And so we were all ready to shoot. And, and uh, action, all the cameras were whirring. And the gates open. And this 75-foot gorilla sort of walked out like Douglas Barder. <laughs> Um, and, and, and an arm fell off, and then another arm fell off, 
And we're just like, God, this is brilliant. <laughs> I, dumbfounded. And then the left breast fell off. And then it all got a bit Werner Herzog. You know, more, more and more body bits are falling off. It. Eventually, it, was, it looked like John Cleese in <laughs> Holy Grail. It was, it was just a, a, an armless, limbless body sitting there. And nobody knew what to say. <laughs> and it's mainly just someone in a costume, though, in the actual film. No, right? no. No, no, they, 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 <laughs> no that, that is the, the actual... The, the, there was a, a Russian ballerina right. who... who, who who um, w uh, w was in the w walked around the model village, smashing the model village up was the, <laughs> the uh, was the yeah for the special the special effects. <laughs> I use the term loosely. Um, yeah, there was a Russian ballerina. In fact, in the original version, um, I think I've, you've seen the picture of me tap dancing with yeah. a, with a gorilla, um, which not many people d have done, and um, <laughs> uh, and that was uh, choreographed weeks to choreograph her in the costume and me in a sort of thong tap dancing but it, it's I would love to see that footage I don't know where it's gone well the film would never was, so Stuart Lee's really, probably got it he's probably Stuart's just yeah, got it it's in his collection it for his own amusement I'm sure but it's uh, <laughs> but he never got he got kind of sued by the King Kong that was coming out and so it, and the film didn't actually come out no well it did us all a favour because um, yeah. <laughs> Rilla Lenska was, who was in it as well um, she we saw a a preview in Wardour Street, uh, and uh, there was great excitement as the those old preview theatres, the little curtains opened, everyone going, yeah, 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 yeah. And at the end, there was like this stunned silence, and just Rilla's voice saying to me, if this ever gets out, darling, our careers are fucked. <laughs> and we were about 24, 25 at the time. And fortunately, next w the next week, Dina De Laurentiis, yeah, who who'd, had produced King Kong, the one with Jeff Bridges, um, uh, he, he put a, some legal suits on it, uh, passing off, and did us all a favour. But it became cult, though, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's worth a look. It's on YouTube. No, don't tell it's people. It's worth a look. Richard, it's crap. <laughs> I, d I, did a, I did a show recently, a stand-up show in, in Darlington recently, and I, uh, well, before all this nonsense, and I, and I said, um, uh, the, the guy who ran the theatre there said, oh, could we show Queen Kong? I said, no. <laughs> No, please don't. Um, and I put it up on Twitter. Um, it, it, it's the worst film ever, ever made. Please. He, he, he sold out, like, in about 10 seconds. He said, can you tell them it's crap again? Because if we do another night. But that's, you know, that's, there's a lot of the, the room and everything, those kind of films where they, they show them at the Prince Charles. And yes. People come and, well, you know. well oh, funny enough, going back to Stuart again, that's his... Uh, thing he wants to sh he wants to show it at the Prince Charles, right? And then to have a chat about it. <laughs> I said, "Was there only one thing wrong with that? I won't be there." You know? <laughs> well, let's talk. Uh, it did make the Confessions film look like a masterpiece comparatively. Rather. Now, careful where you go. <laughs> careful where you go. You're talking. But, you're talking to an, an eclectic actor of. Let's many. talk about because I want to talk about all the other stuff as well because I know there's a lot more to you than Confessions, but that is obviously the thing that people. Um, remember uh, and it's sort of interesting going but I don't I was a bit too young at the time to be watching <laughs> watching them when they first came out but it was that kind of le even as a kid it was a, like this legendary thing but it, it speaks a lot of what it, where Britain was right at the time because th this was this was like a brand new thing to have this much sort of nudity in something right and to well, yeah well if, if, for me uh, as an actor b by 1974 I'd had a uh, we'll maybe talk about that later, but I had a good backlog of work. You know, I'd worked with yeah. Zaffirelli, Pasolini, uh, Lindsay Anderson, um, Pete Walker. Um, I'd, I'd done, done a bit being in a film in Hollywood to play the title. You know, I'd done quite a substantial body of work before 1974. Yeah. Uh, and I remember being presented with the script of Confessions of a Window Cleaner uh, in 1973. Uh, and there was a whole load of us, uh, Dennis Waterman, Richard Beckinsale, um, Richard O'Sullivan, Nicky Henson. Uh, and we, we, we were all scratching our head because we thought, you know, what is this crap? You know, what is it? Because and we all thought, turning the page, what is this shagging? What is this about? You know, it is crap. Uh, and everybody turned it down, including me. And um, but, but it, it went from being a, an independent film. And by then I'd done quite a few independent films with people like Eta, uh, Peter Walker and Richard Gordon, Horror Hospital and films like that. Yeah. And um, 
Uh, the, the, the film started to grow. It moved to Michael Klinger, and then from Michael Klinger, it was picked up by Columbia. There was a guy called David Beagleman who was like the head of all Columbia in um, space. No, all <laughs> Columbia in, um, in, in the States. Who, who he greenlit it. It was an American greenlit. It said, you know, this film's got to be made. And, but it completely reconstructed the whole thing. So the script came back to me. It wasn't just about shagging. It had become like he'd fallen in love with a, the middle-class policeman. Yeah. There, there was um, uh, a, a bit more structure than just a bloke wandering around shagging. Uh, it, it, there was... It, it was um, uh, well, Lindsay Anderson said it was cult in, in Poland. He said, right. he, went out, he, said, he said it was a working man's film. You know, yeah. they, they bowed down to it. Um, so, yes, it was a surprise, but it was more of a surprise to any of us. Um, I mean, before we came on, we were talking about George Layton, the actor George Layton. And it, I remember George saying, you know, Robin, I, I think you, could, you should do this. I think it's, I think, I think you, <laughs> you could do this. Yeah. I said, well, you know, but why is it no? Because, uh, you, you know, it, you, it, you won't be sort of going, <laughs> you'll be going, oh, and that's, I think that's how you're going to make, I think you, so he influenced me. Yeah. And the fact that it could be made funny. Well, it is, it's a comedy rather than, you know, what's interesting is that, I don't know, there's a, it's, very, it's a very innocent film in a lot of ways in that uh, Timmy Lee is, uh, is a very innocent character and he sort of starts as a virgin and... And, and, and yeah, and it gets worse. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he, 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 yeah he's, um, he's sexually inept and, and, yeah. and, and through the contrivance of his job and the, and the jobs in the later films may be a little bit too much of contrivance, he, he, he was put in a situation where there would be a single housewife um, who would engage him uh, in a sexual activity that he was just not up to, he was not up to the, the job, really, and there, therefore was the comedy. And he, yeah. Uh, the, the, the alpha male, of course, was, was, was played by Anthony Booth. Uh, and so you had that, oh, kid, oh, you know, lovely, a bit of crumpet and all that. You had that sort, sort of... And you had me as the sort of beta, yeah. the, um, sit, sitting back and going, oh, I, you know, I don't know, and, and, and being presented with it. There was some com comedy value. And yes, it was completely new uh, to suddenly walk around. Uh, don't forget, there was no um, uh, videos. There was no, um, there, there was no black and white telly, really. Yeah. You know, it was, there was not much going on. So if a, if a film was successful, people used to go to it and queue out queue around the block and the only the only way people went to see uh, th th these films um, was because people would go back to the workplace and say oh you got to see that it's a real laugh so it was females and males and couples were queuing up and it was a, it warmed your heart to be honest <laughs> to uh, except on one occasion outside the shepherd's bush odeon there was uh, my Mini Cooper broke down, and uh, I thought, oh, Jesus Christ. And he said, I flagged down a taxi. I said, um, c c can you give me a lift? He said, I said, I haven't got any money on me. He said, well, I can't. <laughs> oh, well, I can't bought. You've got no money. I said, no, 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 if you've got any identification. And there it had Robin Asquith in Confessions of a Window Cleaner and a key rat round the block. And he went, in your fucking dreams, and drove off. <laughs> And I guess the the women in it, it's you know it's it's I mean it sort of talks to the innocence of the, it's exactly that that now in this society we live where hardcore pornography is you know readily available to everyone if there was any sort of titillation in it it's the it's it's literally titillation there's a little bit of tit <laughs> well in. yes but um, b uh, but. It, it, yes, and it didn't attract the Mary Whitehouse Brigade, right. strangely enough. Uh, they, they, the BBC, there was a programme called Face to Face, and they thought, oh, it'd be a great idea to put Robin Asquith up against Mary Whitehouse. And all we did was sit there agreeing about things. It was, I don't think it was ever aired. <laughs> right. you know, we, we, we weren't arguing about anything. And um, it, it was, but the thing was, it was nudity yeah. uh, and uh, a lot of full frontal and simulated sex. Uh, and that really hadn't been seen uh, on a mass scale. You know, you couldn't take your girlfriend out and go and uh, and, get, and get away with that. You yeah. know, they, they'd be sneaking along, and then suddenly there's it's all, it's all going on. But it sort of saved the British film industry as well, right? Because the British yeah, film people industry... don't like that, do they? No. <laughs> and films and filming certainly didn't like it at the time. Um, 
Yeah, no, it did. It, it, very, much, it, it very much did. And um, friends of mine, like Matthew Sweet, who, who's a film historian um, who's become a close friend, uh, I think in his book, Shepherd and Babylon, actually accused the confession films. He said the only reason people stayed to watch a confession film was it was cold and they were so bored and depressed <laughs> they couldn't get out of their seats. Well, of course, that's nonsense because it, there had to be more people to come and fill the seats and there's only way that would happen by telling people. He, so he's retracted all that now. So historically, um, y yeah, you know, they, they were a very, very important per uh, part of the uh, industry. And, yeah. and at one point, um, I'm sure you were going to lead on to this, what was what we propped up Star Wars? Yeah, no, was, you know, <laughs> was, uh, I was about to go on to that. Although the last thing <laughs> no, I would no, say no, about get, it get, get, is, it. is well, it's sort of if you watch it in watching it again with that distance now, it doesn't feel like a lot of things you watch from the seventies, and there's a lot of stuff in there that you wouldn't watch. That you, and there's some, there is a bit of stuff in there. <laughs> the confession, something that wouldn't fly now, but a lot of it still is okay. And I think the women in it are very much empowered, and so the women are making their own choices. It's about the women... Uh, Including being... some of the actresses, yeah. you know, uh, and th they go on uh, social media now, people like Judy Matheson and people like that, it, it, when somebody has a go at them, says, no, no, hang on, I was in that. I was in that. You know, I'm a feminist. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, even people like Samira Ahmed, you know, they actually defend the whole ethos of, of those films as actually being a bit pro-feminist, you know, they, 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 they were um, not quite what they seem. No, I think there's... In fact, there's... I don't think I ever went four in my life. <laughs> and all you see on Twitter every now, Robin Asquith, four. I don't, I've never gone four, ever. <laughs> well, you've gone four now. So I've now gone four now. now that I've gone four, can, four they times. Can, they can take so, that out as a gif, and then it's four. just you playing... Yeah. Got to think about that. Well, no, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, in, it's on YouTube for free as well, the first one. You can watch that for free. I'm not going to pay for any of these. Um, <laughs> but you did, like, you were, you were let's go to Star Wars because you were filming at the same time as, as Star Wars. Sorry, I led you no, into... No, but I, I was going to go on to because it's fascinating. So you, that, the idea of those two films filming next to each other... Well, is, it, it, was, it was, yeah, it was two. It was Confessions of a Driving Instructor and then we thought we'd... We'd up our game, and we did, we did uh, uh, Leslie Thomas's book, Stand Up Virgin Soldiers. Yeah. So we'd actually taken over Elstree Studios. So I was the king of Elstree. And, um, and uh, Andrew Mitchell, God rest his soul, who was the general manager of um, uh, Elstree at the time, uh, used to like curse this bloody... Uh, f but just to precurse that, that story, there was Dave Prowse, who was a delightful man and was always an extra on the Confessions film and everything else, um, famously said to me, I said to him, have you got any work? You know, I'm just being polite. He said, oh, yeah, then, all right. Uh, George Cukor. <laughs> Who's George Cukor? I mean, George Cukor, it was George Lucas. George Cukor <laughs> has offered me this film called Star Wars. And uh, I said, well, that sounds crap. He said, no, no, it's very good. I said, well, what character have you been offered? And he said, well, it's, I've been offered uh, Chewbacca who's a big furry monster, or a blue in a dark uh, black cape and a helmet. I said, here's the key. Where's it being shot? He said, Tunisia, mostly. I said, black cape. <laughs> um, so that's how he, he came to play Darth Vader. It's true, this is true stuff. Um, so I, I tell that before we, we lead on to how I got involved with the Star Wars, because we were making, we were very successful, Commissioners of a Driving Instructor, that's the third one, we were going to go into Stand Up Virgin Soldiers, all, all the bills were being paid at the studio, but there was one film that wasn't paying their bills, it was the Star Wars. <laughs> it, was, it was dying on its arse, it? all the models were falling over and this, that and the other, uh, and we used to go and visit the set and snigger at what the hell was going on there, and uh, Linda Bellingham, God rest her soul, said, um, said, oh, Asquith, he's a very good-looking chap. The, the, the leading bloke is a very good-looking chap. I'd love to meet him. I said, well, all right, okay. So we're sitting one day, and um, uh, 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 Dave Prowse has said, oh, I'll introduce you to him. Oh, yeah, it's Har his name's Harrison Ford. You, got, you must see he's a nice chap. So I said, well, Linda Bellingham wants to meet him. So we went over, and it was Harrison Ford and uh, Mark Hamill flicking through there, learning their lines. And... Um, so we went over to, to meet them, and uh, Dave Prowse said, oh, Linda, meet 
I'll let you to meet a friend of mine. He's a great bloke. He's a big star. There's a Robin Esquith here. Uh, and, I, and I've said, oh, yeah, and, uh, sorry, what was your name? I didn't get it. He said, uh, Harrison Ford. I said, well, you're going to have to change that, mate. It's two surnames. You, it's not... <laughs> You're not going to get anywhere. And, um, and I, I didn't, two days later, uh, because you, you think of the Han Solo outfit, which was identical to the waiters in the Elstree studio. So I didn't, he didn't love me anymore when he walked past. I said, where is the wine menu? For goodness sake, please, where are you going? He just thought I was an arsehole, really. <laughs> It's so, it's so amazing to think of Linda Bellingham and Harrison Ford's worlds colliding in that way. Exactly. So well, they, did, they didn't, actually, of course. No, they but, didn't. Because... <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, she, he, he, he's a very good-looking bloke, and uh, she, 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 we, we visited the set many, many times for her to gloat and watch this ridiculous nonsense. <laughs> and what was funny about that, all the robot, they all argued. They all hated each other, <laughs> and their heads were falling off. And then, of course, in the middle of this, you've got um, Dave Prowse saying, oh, please let me take this helmet off, please. <laughs> I want to have a kip a roll. <laughs> well, you know, that's show business, isn't it? You just don't know. You don't know what's going to be the big hit. Don't no, know. Know. But, but all, both films still remembered. Maybe not, I mean, Confessions maybe not made as much money as Star Wars. Um, but it did it more at the time. Well, they got the America. They got the, got America, the thing Confessions yeah. ever got was America. Basically, America had uh, Mary Tyler Moore and Deep Throat. <laughs> we, we sort of came in the middle of it, and, that, and it, so it didn't happen, really. No. But not, that I, ca not that I care. It's a very British... But, you know, as you say in your... Well, you, Benny Hill. You, you say in your book about Benny Hill that was the, it was the one who kind of managed to take that yeah. over. Yeah, that was about five years later, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's all... It's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Now, look, let's talk about your childhood a little bit, because I think that sort of does... Before we go into your serious, more serious r roles and the that came before and after um, Confessions, because I think it does sort of inform, and people wouldn't be necessarily aware of this. So as a, as a boy, as a, was it about eight years old, was it when you got... Four. Four, four so you're very young when you, you contracted polio. Yeah. Uh, and so, and were quite badly disabled by, uh, by polio. Yeah, well, um, I think it's depicted very well in the Ian Drury biopic, um, Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll, um, the, the whole polio thing. And if anyone's got the time, I mean, watch that film. That there's a documentary uh, about an hour and a half long about the two American scientists battling over the uh, the, uh, the vaccination. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic story. Um, but polio was around. I mean, obviously, this is quite um, a sort of apt story for now. But polio was around, and I was very unlucky to to have it. And it was, you know, it was nothing to do with class. Whatever. You were, put, you were put into these homes um, because no one was quite sure how you caught it, right. what it was. Um, they certainly weren't going to lock down. They, you know, there was no, 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 it, things weren't treated. There was no social media, but there was polio. Uh, and I was put in one of these homes, uh, and then it got worse. Then I was put in an iron lung for about four months, right. um, and your head's just sticking out. And um, I think um, uh, when you've been through something like that, you just... Um, are pretty grateful that, that any day after that gets better, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was an odd time. But the sort of things you remember are the extraordinary bravery of, um, like, the nurses. I mean, because no one would come and see you. You, you, weren't, you weren't allowed. There was, like, windows at the back where people would come and check on you. But they weren't allowed in because they didn't know what was going on. Right. But there, there were people that nursed you. Uh, and, uh, and there were priests and people would come in, risking everything uh, for, uh, to, to, to sort of touch you and, and, uh, and they burnt all your toys and burnt everything. It was, yeah. a, it, was a, it was a pretty horrendous time. But as a kid, you, of course, you've got no idea um, of anything else. You maybe think everyone else is like this. Sure. Um, and then you're, you're put in, as in the Ian Drury thing, you're put in a, um, uh, a sort of home. And once again, you're not allowed to be seen. And, and, and it, it was distressing my parents because they thought they, he, he should see his parents. So, um, so my grandfather came up with this great idea. Um, and this sounds all wrong now, but you've got to remember this is 1955. Uh, they all blacked up. So 
than my family. And, and this is before Windrush or anything. Yeah. I suddenly was aware of my family standing behind a, a, a glass window, blacked up. Right. But first of all, it didn't mean anything to me in anything. <laughs> there was my family blacked up, which is even more distressing. <laughs> what, what's happened to them? <laughs> I um, was very, very fortunate, um, as was Ian Drury in a way. You, you, you know, most people died, or, uh, and, and that was the end of it, or, or were left with the unbelievable bits falling off them. Yeah. And... Um, my mother said, look, I'm going to give you throatments. Uh, eventually, when I got out of the hospital about nine months, and got out of the home. Uh, and you got out of the home, they just said, they said to your parents, and I mean, we were a very good middle-class family. We, you know, we, we weren't short of anything. They said, you do not treat this boy with any fear. You don't, you, you, you're, you're stricter with him than your other children. For some reason, that's what they thought you had to do. And, um, but my mother, and I was in a wheelchair and stuff, and my mother said, um, I'll give you throatments because I was brought up in Southport in Lancashire, you go up to the slipper baths, the, the, the uh, saltwater baths, and, uh, and so I was given thrupments, and every day my leg got stronger. So I was <clears throat> pretty swimming. lucky. Through swimming. Yeah. Um, so so I, was, I was very, very lucky indeed. Yeah, uh, and so, I mean, that obviously must have... So, like, when you, you, know, you got fitter and you were able to walk again, and it must have, it must have been sort of mind-blowing, and it must have informed the kind well, of person you became. Well, yes, I, 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 I became very obviously ad addicted to sport and, and, uh, and was lucky enough to go to very sporty schools yeah. uh, and played sports somehow. To, uh, I mean, I had a dodge... If, if cricket, people um, would notice that I had a slight gait running to, r running to the boundary. And in those days, you, had, you know, we had nicknames and mine was Spaz. You right. know, that was my nickname. Yeah. How well would that go down today? <laughs> but, um, but I didn't mind. You sort of wore it with pride and it did make you try harder. And also, I never talked about polio until about four or five years ago. Right. And it was because, once again, we were talking about him earlier, it was George Layton, who we were having a chat on stage at the Cinema Museum. Uh, and he asked me, which we you're going to ask me, um, why on earth did I take your clothes off in front of a camera crew? And why did you do it with such ease? And I did it in F, the first film I was ever in. Uh, there's a shower scene. Yeah. And I said, do you know what I think it is, George? I said, I think it's when you've been naked as a child and, and people photograph you, your body, slightly deformed, and you, you've given this chance that it's all sorting itself out. You don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You don't, I'm naked, bollocks to it, if you, you know, literally. <laughs> literally. Uh, don't mention bollocks. I, was, I know, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's your show, I'm feeding. <laughs> but, you know, it's that, it's, you know, and, and it must have been just so great to feel, you know, that you were seen as a sex symbol and that people wanted to see you naked. That that must have been... Yeah, but I, know, I don't think I ever took my clothes off and went, look at this, yeah. you know. It was... Um, I mean, I must have say I'm, I'm amazed that when I watch something like Horror Hospital and I'm running through fields being chased by leather-clad bikers and, and there's somewhere there's a six-pack. And I think, first of all, there were no gyms then. How, how did that happen? <laughs> um, but at no point did I think go whoopee. It was more the fact that I could move. You know, I was yeah. just pleased. I, I was never... Um, I, was, I never... It was a sort of gay, the early gay thing of, of the, the, the early 70s. That, that I was m more aware that I, m my body was quite cool because, you know, I was pursued by um, directors, right. mostly Italian. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was only then that I realized, oh, you know, I'm uh, quite attractive here. Yeah. But, but I, I didn't, it didn't really mean that much. Um, and also, from sc you were quite a naughty boy at school. Yes. And so you, I mean, you, you yes. play. Yes. I mean, there's stories in the the, the the autobiography is very much worth reading. I hope you'll write this, the second one as you promised at the end of the first one, but we haven't seen it yet. Uh, but you you talk about getting your headmaster's car put on the chapel roof by well, yes, by I a man went in a crane. Is that for real? <laughs> yeah. Well, I went to um, a merchant tailor's school. Um, which was a very good public school. Uh, I, I was at Orley Farm first prep school with Anthony Horowitz, and um, uh, every time I mention it on Twitter, Orley Farm, he says, oh, he, he'll, he'll put a message. He says, uh, straight, I've got to go straight back to the psychiatrist. <laughs> you know, he had a terrible time. Right. Uh, and Simon were calking down people. And then I went to Merchant Taylor's, and um, it was just that time, Richard, it was the 60s, and the music, uh, and, and do, do you know what it was? It was as simple as this. National service got stopped. Right. And we thought, great. 
this good, we're not going to have to fight. We're not have to fight a war. Yeah. You know, and every generation before us had fought a war. You know, the Second World War, the First World War, Boer War, Crimea War, whatever. It all went back to wars. And the, the, we did not want to fight a war. And then this whole music thing came through. The peace and love thing came through. And I was in a public school, and I had imagination, and I was quite popular. And I thought, I'm just going to have a, 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 a ball. And I was passing exams all right, somehow. Yeah. So, and I was quite good at sport. So I was, I was having a great time, but I was not popular with, with the masters, particularly the headmaster. Um, so, yeah, I got, I got a friend of mine, a wealthy friend of mine, whose father owned Crane Frohauf or whatever those, whatever, Massey Ferguson, one of those. And we I persuaded, paid one of his workmen to bring a crane and remove on the Sunday the headmaster's Austin 1100 and put it on the chapel. So he, he came out, apparently, allegedly, he came out and just opened the door and saw his car and went, Asquith, <laughs> which I thought was unfair, you know. It was correct, but uh, it was slightly unfair. Uh, yeah, and, and eventually I was just coming up to A levels, and I was going mad. You know, yeah. it was it, I was in a I was in a band. I just replaced Peter Gabriel as a drummer because he was useless um, uh, in a band. That, so my my drumming career looked quite. Uh, uh, thing uh, and um, it was very good for girls I joined the, the young communist party which w wasn't very popular at public school either uh, but it was great for girls to stand outside the top rank Watford uh, issuing out copies of Young Socialist until our friend's father picked us up in the jag you know it was, um, <laughs> it, was it was all a bit of a giveaway um, nothing's changed um, so um, uh, yeah, in the end, this headmaster just, he, he, he made a speech uh, at an assembly about the Dolce Vita life that Robin Asquith was leading, uh, and it's not to be commended at all. Uh, and I'm sitting there, and people are thinking, God, this sounds great. <laughs> you know, he made an error there. And so my next move was to raid the armory, because uh, it, was, it was rag week. And uh, we, we, we held up in a post office and, um, and took all the commemorative stamps. I gave them back, of course. Um, but I, I, eventually he did expel me. He let me back to my A-levels. Um, and uh, I, I, talking of obituaries, I, 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 I'm one of the only people, I think, that are mentioned in the headmaster's obituary. In his Sunday Times obituary, <laughs> this is one of his great regrets is expelling me. Um, uh, Robin Asquith, he was a man of high spirits, no, nothing more, which was a nice... That is nice, but you did yeah. put his car on a roof and held up a post office. I mean, I know the 60s and 70s were liberal, but... But, but hang on, there's nothing salacious about that. <laughs> there was nothing political. It is, no, it's funny. There's it's nothing funny. political. It was, it, was inve it was quite inventive. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's very inventive. Yeah. And it's an Austin 1100, for fuck's sake. <laughs> but you know, you, do you feel that you lived at this sort of golden time, that you had your teenage years at that time and then going into the 70s and becoming this very successful actor? Yes, I do. I think I think fancy I'll... free and single just when the pill had come out and everyone had, and, uh, and uh, sexual and liberation. Yeah, no, I, I, I had a fantastic time. Um, I, I, I really did. The only, the only thing, and I think where you and Stuart and stuff were, I'm not going to say lucky, but had something that we didn't have, is we didn't have any stand-up. Uh, even yeah. though I was an actor, uh, I would be... Uh, the, the guy used to hand, hand the... Um, I've never told him. I used to hand the, the, the young socialist out. Yeah. His next-door neighbour was Barry Cryer. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So we used to... Get, um, Barry was terrific, you yeah. know, very encouraging, being a young actor, and he was always very encouraging. And I, even then I would be telling some story about something in his front room, and he said, you should be a comedian. But I didn't want to be a comedian. I did not want to be a comedian. And I was about 19 a bit later on, so I'm starting to work... And he said, this is the sort of bloke you should be like. Uh, and he brought in a 17-year-old Jim Davidson. Right. And, I, and at that point, I thought, no, I, that's just exactly who I don't want to be fucking like, Barry. <laughs> and so when your era came along, the, uh, you, you, and, well, it's, you kicked off a bit early with Billy Connolly, you know, the yeah. stream of consciousness. Um, um, I, I, th that is the only thing I really missed, missed out on. Sure. But you're doing that, so you're doing, doing it now. You're doing, yeah. it now. Well, you're doing, doing these one-man shows, and, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, that's... Tickets available, um, 
the twentieth. Yeah, it's such a it's such a rich life, and there's so I mean, there's a lot of stories you've got about. We don't have time to get onto all of them. I'll just check. We we have got some time, uh, but I do want to talk about lots. I've of different I've got till things. Thursday. But yeah, we can keep going. But you know, the, I mean, there's you you've worked with everyone, and it's what is interesting. I think certainly through that. Read again, reading the book, you're, you're, you're meeting Al Pacino, you're meeting Peter Cook, you're meeting Pamela Stevenson. It's a, like a very, you know, broad range of different kinds of people that you're working. You know, there's Harrison Ford, you're meeting all these different people in these different circumstances. And so you've got all these incredible stories of, you know, and, and you did all the partying and you did all the, you know, enjoying, <laughs> enjoying every aspect of, of that 70s life and the sex and drugs and rock and roll. You were with all the pop stars, you were with all the actresses. There was drugs. Uh, you'd hang out with Oliver Reed and survived. Yeah, a few nights with Oliver Reed. Yeah, uh, yeah well, the famous one was, uh, was I was, had a tiny part in a film called Nicholas and Alexandra. Yeah. And uh, I was staying at the Madrid Hilton. And, <laughs> um, and I, oh, it, it, there was a sequence in it where I have to run through sunflower uh, fields. It's about 100 miles north of Madrid. They were filming it. But the sunflowers hadn't turned round at the right <laughs> speed. So they were waiting for the sunflowers to turn before they could do these shots with me, with my uh, girlfriend. Uh, and we rolled around where we had to do in this film. Um, uh, and um, so it was crazy. A multi million dollar. I'm just sitting in the Madrid Hilton uh, in the bar. And then Oliver Reed, who wasn't even in the film, turned up and took quite a liking to me. And uh, <laughs> And I'm 19. I've got nothing to do. I'm waiting for these flaming sunflowers to turn around, uh, and he, which he thought was very amusing. <laughs> and, and we used to drink every, every night. And he, uh, there was a huge fish tank behind the bar. And um, one night, there's some Americans driving him mad. And he, went, he just went, he said, just keep these Americans talking, ask with old chap. I'll be back, right? So I kept him talking. The fish tank's here, and I'm talking to these Americans, and suddenly they went, ah, gee, oh, my God! And in the fish tank was Oliver Reed naked, <laughs> attacking a carp, um, which, uh, and they ran out, you know, and, it, and, you know, evenings like that. Yeah. Just, just a terrific, you know. But is that when there was so much money in the movies and, you know, they could... I mean, I, th I suppose there still is in the big, big blockbusters, but there was just... It just seemed like there was endless money going on and that they could keep you waiting for months. Well, for yes, there were, there were two types of films. There was, there was those type of films. And then, uh, you know, a year later, I'd be making a film like Cool It Carol with having a leading part in an independent film. Um, a very underrated film, in, in my opinion. Um, uh, and you're, you're, you're filming six pages a day. Yeah. Um, it's a completely... And you're working all sorts of hours. And then you, you're, you're right. And then suddenly I'd be flown off somewhere to be in another small part and another big budget film. And you're, you're sitting... I remember once sitting by a swimming pool for two weeks getting a suntan, and the second assistant of the second assistant of the second assistant said, we're going to need you tomorrow. And I, I genuinely looked disappointed <laughs> because I thought, well, I'm not tanned down here. <laughs> you know, I've got another week here. Um, but yeah. you were, reading the book, it just seems like you were working constantly. Your year was incredibly... You were doing TV, you were doing films, and you were, you were working with Pasolini and having to wee off balconies and... Um, yeah, well, I, my, my, my thing was, was uh, just work. And I had yeah. an agent, a, a great uh, lady called Hazel Malone, uh, who had Richard O'Sullivan, Jeremy Bullock, um, Malcolm McDowell, uh, Susan George, Judy Jason. You know, she had, she, had, she had a good crop of people. And she'd, she'd keep you and encourage you to keep working, not to sit around and wait for the big one to come along. So, yeah, I would do an episode of Please Sir, uh, and then I'd fly off to Hollywood and, and play a, a lead in a, in a musical of uh, ice skating and <laughs> dancing. Um, you know, all the actors lie about everything, don't they, when they go for an audition. Can you sing? Yeah. Can you dance? Yeah. Can you ice skate? Yes. So um, <laughs> I could do none, but that, I, I could by the time it finished. Uh, so, but but I, my work ethic was just to keep working. Yeah. And whatever precise part it was. But so you were work, but you were working. So you worked with Pasolini. You worked with Lindsay Anderson. You worked in these films that have, have gone on to be classic films, as, as and as quite a serious actor in in some of them. And so do you? What do you do? You feel? I mean, obviously you had that decision to make about going to confessions, and you didn't know whether 
what what that would lead to. The, it would, you could never have no idea it become successful as it did. No idea. Now, I, when you look back, do you? It's, I mean, it's an impossible thing to, to it's decide. Impossible. Isn't it? But do you look back and think you you know you wish you'd not done that and and then gone down the route of being a I more wonder, serious actor, or do you think that would? Well, it's interesting. Uh, the only way. Because it, it, it is an impossible question, because it's there and it's happened. And, and it's very strange, like I do my one-man show and I look at the audience and there's people of 25. That's a bit like me at 25 going to see Douglas Fairbanks Senior, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but but the, 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 um, Robert Lindsay was a good friend of mine uh, and still is a good friend of mine. And I remember at, at the height of Citizen Kane, uh, Citizen Kane, uh, Citizen Smith, yeah. saying... saying mm-hmm. um, I shouldn't get a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> just made a mistake. Um, he, 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 he swerved away. He went off to the Royal Exchange Manchester yeah. uh, and uh, did Hamlet and stayed there for many, many years, taking his career in a completely different direction. Uh, and I remember staying with him. I went to see him in, in, in something up there. I think it was uh, Three Musketeers, which he did with Derek Griffiths but fant- and Trevor Peacock. Fantastic production. And he said, you know, we, we made our choice. I was doing Who Goes Bear at the Empire, <laughs> Liverpool, and he was doing the Three Musketeers at the Royal Exchange. You know, we made, our, we made our choice. But you sort of make a choice and it's not, but you don't know where it's going to lead. No. So you could easily have done Confessions and it could have been... You know, the fact that it's remembered all these years later is incredible. Uh, and, 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 the, and you couldn't predict that it would be... You know, obviously that is then going to affect the roles that you're offered in the future. But you have also, you know, you have gone on and done loads of different aspects of acting since then. And, and I kind of think, you know, you're, you're, a very, you're a very funny actor and you're a very funny person. So I think you would have, got, I think you would have probably gravitated towards comedy in any case. I think you're but right. And I've, um, to, to move into the present, if I'm allowed to, um, you saying that, is I've just, and you, you'll, you'll see it, uh, I have no idea how successful anything is going to be, and I really hope it is. Um, um, Sally Lindsay sort of vir- virtually taught me into this new series, Madame Blanc, which we've just finished shooting um, for, for Channel 5 with Steve Edge, um, um, Sue Holderness, uh, Sally Lindsay, um, and, and me. And it's, it's a drama series, sort of Montalbano meets Lovejoy, if you like, um, set, set in France. And I had to be talked into doing it by Sally because it is a very, it's, a, it's quite a serious part sure. with, with a sort of eccentric trait uh, which c- could be exploited um, so, so, so yeah I mean I, I'm very lucky at the age I am now to suddenly someone see that and go yeah you can do that you don't because I must say I've got a bit fed up of tripping over the furniture and, and, and farce and, and whatever as much as I, I've, I've yeah. you know enjoyed that but you know you, I think you really made the most of it and you obviously enjoyed yourself at the time when you were doing it you did like live shows with with the confession stuff, which you basically created a comic persona and ad-libbed around a, a, a script that someone else had written that wasn't Well, fine. yeah, what, what, that, well, what that was, was, was at the end of the confessions, when they, everyone made a conscious decision, right, that's the end, confessions of a holiday camp, we're going to do no more. And they were still making money. Whatever anybody said, they were making money, and there was a decision to make, um, to make no more, mainly by Greg Smith and me. And... Um, I, I was suddenly having had all that success with all the films. I'd made about 30 films by, that, by then. Yeah. And, um, and for all sorts of different directors and producers and stuff. And uh, so I had to make a decision. What the hell was I going to do? So what I did, I went up to Columbia's offices in Wardour Street, got a map of the world, and I said, where are these films successful? And so I went, right. And I got a script that somebody else wrote, correct, uh, and it was so awful that the further confessions of window cleaner. I sort of did a Gary Shandling before Gary Shandling did it. I came out to the audience and said, "Look, I'm really sorry about this show. It is dreadful. There's nudity, and and uh, you're going to hate it. Some of the cast are crap." I said, um, "It's all we could get." Um, and uh, when when there's nudity, look away. It's offensive. It's all oh, this. And then I would step into the into the play. Yeah. And all these dreadful things will hap- would happen. Uh, and, um, a- a- and the audience, w- it just p- 
packed out all around the world. So there was five years of that. Yeah. Which was virtually stand up, sort of. Yeah, it was. I mean, what you, and you talk about in the book about being the th- you were going to Rhodesia and uh, the theatre being sort of bombed as you, were <laughs> as you were performing, not because they didn't like the show. No, they're... no, 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 <laughs> no, no. We're, well, in one case, we're right in the middle of the war, and uh, somebody said, "Oh, you can't go to Rhodesia." I said, "Well, I said that's the time to go. That's the time to go." And um, the great thing about Rhodesia is we had our crew were both Matabele and Shona. We had we had both tribes working for us, and they all got on, right. you know, because the, they love the theatre. You know, then outside, they're not they're, they're shooting each other, but um, in the theatre, they. Um, there was a guy, I talked about this to a friend last night, about, I had a guy used to make, um, used to come up and bring me a cup of tea in the interval. And, uh, and, everything. and he was a lovely old man, and the many years I went to Rhodesia, um, he, 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 his name was Tifa. And at the end, it, when it obviously became, you just couldn't go back anymore. And um, he, he said, I'm gonna say goodbye now, my boss, I'll never see you again. I said, oh. I said, of course you would. No, 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 no. It's bad. It's bad. So I said, can I ask you one question? I said, I've always wanted to know why you call Tifa, I, expecting to hear some sort of uh, um, embellished tribal uh, saga. And he said, it is because I make tea for you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was really sweet. No, I, I was very lucky. I would, you know, traveled all around the world and was arrested in South Africa. Yeah. I was arrested for indecency, yes, um, um, mercifully, and uh, <laughs> escorted to the airport. And at the airport, uh, as I'm being, I was handcuffed, taken out at Joburg, at the Jens Smith Airport, uh, the, coming the other way was Gareth Hunt, <laughs> who was being fated and photographed as I'm being handcuffed, taken out. <laughs> he, I think he was wondering, is this what happens to all English actors? <laughs> it could be. And so in the book, at the end, you do talk about getting on a flight somewhere and a guy saying to you, um, I had my first wank over you. Uh, yep. How does it feel about knowing that a lot of men in the 1970s... No, but wait a minute. The point about that story <laughs> is it was first class <laughs> right. and it was between London and Singapore. I was going out to Australia. It was first class seats and we were sitting there and this guy, he was a, a philosopher, he was a... Doctor Philosophy, <laughs> he taught at uh, Swansea University, right. and he was a highly academic <laughs> man. He's talking about this and that and stuff. I had no idea what he was talking about, but pretended to. And we're going on, and I hadn't talked about me at all. I just assumed he just thought I'm somebody. I don't know what he thought I was. And I've sat there. Any case, as as he's leaving the aircraft, that's exactly what he said. <laughs> By the way, he said, that just like you don't know, you were my first wank. <laughs> I thought, Jesus, I thought, as long as it wasn't during the flight. I'm glad he, yeah. No, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a 14 hour flight. <laughs> <laughs> but is, how does it feel to know? I mean, it sort of feels, again, looking at it from, the, from a 21st century perspective, it sort of feels ridiculous that anyone could use confessions of window cleaners as pornography because it seems so tame. But then I remember what I used to use of pornography in the, in the 1970s and 80s. <laughs> go, okay. <laughs> I would have quite liked what? this. Um, but, you know, to know that that's... <laughs> you got that me you're, the bum, you're the bum getting in the way of a lot of horny young men's <laughs> fantasies. Yes. Well, I don't know. Maybe he was just gay. You yeah, know. it could be true. Yeah, no, he, he yeah. could, uh, maybe I was just his first wank. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Maybe he came out of the closet. You yeah. know, it's... I'd, um, yeah, I, it, it's... But I've never thought of it like that. I never no. thought of it as salacious or anything. It was just a job and, and trying to... I know it sounds stupid, but and trying to make people laugh, yeah. you know, um, with, with, within those confines. But that was the point. That's why the confession films, in my mind, came to an end, was I, I had Shagger's block. There, you know... <laughs> There was nowhere I could go anywhere, you know. There was every possible position situated, it had been done. There was no more jokes about it. <laughs> I would, I would, um, I would have, I was going to say I had to lose a testicle, but, I mean, <laughs> but um, you know, there was nowhere, to, there was nowhere, to, there was nowhere to go with it. And also, I was sick to death of shagging. Yeah. Well, it's, but it's difficult to film that. I mean, I've talked to other people about very limited. It's difficult to be filmed, you know, simulating or even... With, Hundreds with, of times. Yeah, with, surrounded by a big crew of 
more yeah, men yeah. coming in to see the naked women, I'm guessing. It always makes me laugh when people say, oh, I must have been great, all those <laughs> girls, blimey, must have been terrific, wouldn't it? Uh, but it, it, it's, it's eight o'clock in the morning, <laughs> bright lights, so you, every, you can see everyone's pimples and spots, and, and you've, got, you've got lines, you, you've, got, you've got to engage with a woman, like a Linda Bellingham or Pamela Stevenson, whoever you're with, or uh, Jill Gascoigne, you know, some good Liz Fraser, there's some good people out there. Yeah. But, but it was a film, people wanted to be in films. So we, it, we, it was quite nerve-wracking. And also, as the leading actor, I had to relax them a little bit because they were very, very nervous. Sure. Um, and, you know, you're in a bath with Liz Fraser, and I suddenly came out with this idea, oh, wouldn't it be great? Because we're shagging away in a bath. I said, I've got this idea to the director. Can we pretend there's a duck underneath her ass? So just to try and make it different. So, and then lay on the track. <laughs> And they went, oh, that's brilliant. Liz, is that all right? Oh, yeah, great idea. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, <laughs> is this the sort of conversation Alec Guinness had with Jack Hawkins? Um, uh, most probably, actually, but uh, it's another, another story. And um, um, uh, so, so they got this toy duck, and we improvised around it. So yeah. um, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an incredible thing. And, it, you know, and, and it, you're right that all the actors, there's a lot of big actors in those films. There's a lot of No, I, I know what I was going with it. Was, 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 um, in the end, you run out of ideas. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you have um, everybody watching, you, you're doing... And, of course, arts became so popular, they wanted to sell to all the different uh, uh, regions. So that we had to make an A version, which was naked, a B version, which was the girls with their tops off, uh, and their bottoms on, and I was naked. Then there was a C version, which were shagging in underwear. And um, I asked, I one day got so fed up with all this, and also it was rubbing me, you know. And I, I said, um, what, um, but who's this for? They said, South Africa. And I thought, we're making a whole version for South Africa of people shagging with their clothes on. <laughs> That's sort of, you know, crazy. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, it was, but that, that's what I sort of think is an historical document. <laughs> it's really interesting because it tells you a lot about the society, you know, A, that, that, was, that any of that stuff was sort of titillating. It sort of shows you how repressed, in a way, the country that people must have been, or, you know, even as free love was, was kind of, was the, is the pervasive thing, that people were going to the cinema to see this this kind of bawdy romp. They were, they, well, there was an element of, rep of repression. Well, I'm, I'm slightly moving o away, but to, to sort of the same point is having just made a television series with COVID restrictions, mm. you've got to remember that Confessions of a Window Cleaner, for instance, was made during the three-day week. Right. Um, and dustbins were piling up. Uh, and there was a huge uh, unemployment. Uh, and, and the unions were, were, were strangleholding the, the film industry. And you'd be in the middle of a scene at 5.20, the bell that was the end of the day yeah. it was it was it was not easy to make make a make a film with all those so you're right yeah um so to, to make a film that then was successful but then there was people that didn't d d didn't like it yeah i remember um at a press junket at the odeon birmingham um some guy the critic up there uh he's, it, he actually assaulted me <laughs> he's, he said bless you he said you are He's, he said, are you taking the piss then? And, and, and actually lunged towards me and had right. to be pulled off me. That, that's, that, that's, I, 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 was, I was secretly popular, a bit like Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> you know, I never met anyone that voted for Margaret Thatcher, yet she had this enormous um, uh, majority. Sure. I, at the time, I've met very few people that saw a confessions film. <laughs> but then I looked in my bank account and I thought... <laughs> Well, I think a few people have seen it, you know. <laughs> Something, something's going on here. Well, it's, it, it is, it's a really interesting to look back at, and I think, you know, and I think, what, and I think from a comedy perspective, I think it holds up, and it's, the heart of it is, is in a good place, I think. And obviously, over 40, 50 years, a lot of things change, and a lot of, of, of well, what we laugh at changes, but I think a lot, you know, a surprising amount of it uh, holds up, which is really unusual with comedy, I think. It's gone, it's gone through different phases because yeah. there was when it came out the 70s and then it sort of dipped away and then of course VHS came along which was most probably well no because you, you were born in 86 were you I was born in 67 so I was 67 right, so 67. I was I was 
Sorry. when VHS was coming out, yeah. I, was, I was looking at things that's similar right. to... So, to so that's what I meant. The, the, the 86 was round about the VHS yeah. time. So then, it, and then it was, so it hit that market. Then that market died down. And then suddenly I'm getting a call from a magazine called Loaded um, from um, James Brown or someone saying, oh, will you do an article for my magazine Loaded? I said, what? What are you talking about? What's Loaded? And uh, he said, oh, you've just rescued Channel 5. I said, have I? He said, yes. It was dying on its ass, and the w a woman had taken over Channel 5. I can't remember her name. She randomly bought the confession films, which were the first thing that ever rated. So they had another life. Yeah. And then the DVDs, uh, and now this, this, the, the whole sort of retro thing. Sure. And, and the fact that I'm still alive and can talk about well, it's it. it's good you're still alive, <laughs> and you're looking absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, we can, people might be able to work out how old you are, and you don't look that old. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and what's the, you're still doing a lot of swimming. I've done a lot of swimming, well, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, I was swimming yesterday morning, I swam two miles yesterday morning. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, I, 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 I've got a, because I live in, as you know, in Malta, in Gozo, and um, there, there was a complete, complete uh, and utter lockdown uh, early this year. So I, got a, I, got a, I do use it if I can. I got a doctor's note saying, uh, this man has had polio. And, <laughs> I, and like a shark, he's got to keep moving, you know? So, um, so they let me swim in the sea. And then I put, so I bought a 1.5 mil suit and used to just swim out the, the harbor every day and disappear up the coast. Well, it's incredible, Rob, and I'm glad you're still going. I'm glad you're still working, and I'm glad uh, you're doing this new sort of stand-up element of your career, and I wish you very well with it. I'm definitely going to come see it. Ladies and gentlemen, massive round of applause. The amazing Robin Thank Asquith, you very much. legendary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go. Yeah, let's go. We'll both go. Thank you. We'll be Thank back you. next week. Come back next week.